You're watching Science for Singers. We're going to start with a way of looking at the voice, which is maybe a little bit different, some terms that you're not used to hearing. So when we hear source filter interaction, this is not a concept that we're familiar with. And so let's talk about this. How does your voice work? So we have air and vocal fold vibration, and we're going to think of this as the source. This is your power source. We blow air and your vocal folds actually come together and are blown apart and they open and close just like this. So this is the source of the sound. Then we have the filter. And the filter is everything from your vocal folds to your lips. So all that space that the sound travels through and bounces around before it makes it out your mouth to the listener's ear. We're going to call that the filter. So let's look at some basic anatomy. You can go very deep with anatomy. There's a lot of muscles. There's a lot of ligaments. There's a lot of cartilage. But what we want to do is just focus on a few muscle groups that I think you need to understand. The larynx, not the larynx, also known as the voice box, houses your vocal folds. It's made up of cartilage, muscle, ligaments, and nerves. How the vocal folds create sound is by phonating or opening and closing in a wave pattern. And I always like to use my hands for this. You get into this kind of an action, blown apart from the bottom, and they make this wave. Here's another view of the larynx. So what we're looking at here is the front view. Okay? If you reach out and touch the front of your throat, that is the front of your larynx. So your vocal cords are hiding inside. The vocal folds are a fascinating system, absolutely fascinating. They're made up of multiple layers. So we have this drawing here that shows them. We have the epithelium, which is a thin skin-like layer. Then we have the superficial and immediate and deep layer, very much like a gel type substance. And then we have the thyroarytenoid muscle. And we're gonna come back to the thyroarytenoid multiple times in these classes. So this is one vocal fold. There's actually, would be another one exactly like this, opposite on the other side. So another name for the epithelium in the superficial layer is the mucosa layer. You'll sometimes hear singers describe the mucosa layer. The vocal ligament, which is the intermediate and deep layer of the vocal folds. And the thyroarytenoid muscle. So what muscles control the vocal folds? So here we're looking down at the vocal folds. So you see the vocal folds are attached at the front. So one of the first muscle groups we're going to look at is the cricothyroids, or CTs. These muscles are very important because they cause front cartilage to tilt and therefore cause the vocal folds to stretch. When the vocal folds stretch, they raise pitch. Ah, I'm stretching my vocal folds. Now here we're looking at muscles along the sides. These are the lateral cricoarytenoids, or LCAs. These muscles close the very top of the vocal folds. So we go back to our hands. The top edge of the vocal folds, when it comes together, that's being closed by the lateral cricoarytenoids. So here we have the thyroarytenoids again. I told you they would come back. This is a very, very important muscle group for anybody who uses their voice. What the thyroarytenoids do is actually the opposite of what the cricothyroids do. So the TAs will actually shorten the vocal folds. After the cricothyroids have stretched them, the TAs shorten them. So this means that they'll actually be responsible for lowering the pitch. Not only that, what they do is they close the bottom of the vocal folds. So whereas the LCAs close the top of the vocal folds, the TAs close the bottom. Now this is important because we're gonna come back to this idea that we want to open and close a fair amount of depth of the vocal folds when we get our wave. The other thing that the thyroarytenoids will do, and they're such an amazing muscle group, is they'll actually raise pitch for you when you're in your lower range. Now, we had the LCAs that close the vocal folds on top, so we have to have a muscle group that opens them at some point. When the vocal folds open, that's when they're at rest. So when you're just breathing, without making any sound, the vocal folds are actually apart. And it's the posterior cricoarytenoids that do that. The PCAs 
open the vocal folds. And you see them here at the back. Here we have video of a cow larynx. The dark purple muscles there are the cricothyroid muscles, and they cause the cartilage above to tilt forward. We can see that when this happens, the vocal folds stretch. Now we actually have video of my vocal folds. Notice how the vocal folds stretch for those higher pitches. Anybody grossed out yet? So now we come to what is a pretty controversial topic for a lot of singers and voice teachers. Registers. You've all heard the terms chest voice, head voice, mix, whistle register, falsetto. Sometimes you hear super head, chest mix, mix head. I don't know. Here's the problem with this kind of terminology. There's so much confusion and debate in the vocal world because many people have defined them based on their own personal sensations. So I think this is a faulty way to approach this because if you de define something based on how you feel, then the assumption is that another person should feel it the same way and we can never be guaranteed that that's going to be the case. So the reality is that our registers are constantly changing as we raise pitch and change volume. That's because the transfer of tension from the thyroretinoids to the cricothyroids can be subtly or wildly different. And this is really important. What I'm describing here is a singer's ability to transfer muscular tension in a way that the listener can't hear it happening or not. For most developing students, they don't have that ability yet. For example, if I do an octave arpeggio, what I'm trying to do is transfer that muscular tension so subtly that you can't hear it. This creates the illusion of one register. So a lot of people would say, oh, you sang that completely in chest voice. Or they'd say that was a very strong mix. What's the answer? The other alternative is a very obvious transfer of tension. Ah! People would call that a flip. So what did I do there? I flipped into falsetto. Well, what I did was I transferred tension from the thyroretinoids to the cricothyroids very obviously, and you can hear the difference. Now, for me personally, I prefer not to actually even use these terms um, because there is so much confusion. But if you like to use the term chest voice or head voice or mix, that's totally cool. I just think it's important to understand from a physiological perspective what's happening based on those sounds that we've learned to identify. So when we think about registers, there's actually three ways that we can define registers. The first one is the sound and character. What does chest voice sound like? What does mix sound like? What does falsetto sound like? Now, again, we're in an area where this is a little debatable and everybody's gonna have slightly different definitions. The other is the singer's sensation. The third is the muscular function. And this is where I prefer to find my own definitions of these terms. So with that in mind, let's go a little bit deeper. When we talk about chest voice, or how I like to call it, full voice, it's a very strong and resonant sound. Ah! There's a lot of thyroarytenoid muscle tension in that sound. Not bad tension necessarily, but tension nonetheless. And this means that the vocal folds are in a rectangular position. Now when we say rectangular position, we're talking about a lot of depth of the vocal folds. This is one of the ways that we create that sound. Now we have mix. Mix is, I think most people would describe it as strong and resonant, but a little bit lighter than chest voice. Mix voice has a balance of thyroarytenoid and cricothyroid tension. And the vocal folds are in a less rectangular position. So instead of this, they're maybe a little bit more like this. Now we come to falsetto. Falsetto is very light and flute-like quality. Ah! It uses little to no thyroarytenoid activity. And so as a result, the bottom of the vocal folds are not closed. But the top is. We call this a convergent position. And we're going to come back to this idea of vocal fold position, rectangular versus convergent. So now that you have this knowledge about registers and what's actually happening on a muscular level, let me ask you a question. What happens when we crack? What happens when we flip? 
We all know that feeling. Ah, ah. Or we go for a high note. Ah, and it just completely lets go. What happens? Well, let's go back to our muscles. The thyroarytenoids and the cricothyroids. When thyroarytenoids completely disengage, whether it's from an excess of tension or a lack of coordination, that creates an instant flip. As a result, we go from singing in this position, rectangular position of the vocal folds, to a convergent shape. Ah! So let's finish this video by kind of bringing this all together. And we're gonna have a quick look at higher notes. You know, everybody seems to get that higher notes are more difficult to sing than lower notes. But why is this? I mean, it's not the case with every single instrument. You think of a piano or a guitar, it makes no difference whether you're playing a higher or a lower note. And yet with singing, most people run into this problem. So why is that the case? We've been talking about the thyroarytenoids and the cricothyroid muscle groups. Coordination between these two muscle groups is absolutely vital if you want to have the ability to sing a lot of range with a lot of power. How do you sing your vowels and consonants? Do you know that there is an optimum way of doing that? And it's a little bit different for everybody. But how you pronounce your words has a huge effect on whether singing a note is impossible or relatively easy. Too much air. If you blow too much air, you can overwhelm the entire system. So we then have to use more muscle tension to force this coordination to happen. And the last reason is just general excessive physical tension. Sometimes people will come in for a lesson and you know the stresses of the day are getting to them and they're just tight. They have tension in this area. The jaw in particular is often very tension. People grind their teeth at night and people come in and they're already talking like this. This is gonna cause problems because all of these muscles have a relationship to each other. So if you're tense in your jaw, it's likely to cause tension in the laryngeal area. Join us for part three.